Welcome to the Creativity Thinking and Education Podcast with your host, Patricia Rose Upsack. Today, we're going to be talking to the remarkable Dr. Anthony Armstrong, who is going to explore and talk to us about happiness education. Welcome, Tony. Thanks. And so, hello, Patricia. Hello. Can you, um, first off, right off the bat, because what happens is I get so involved in what my guests talk about that I forget to ask for their information so that the audience can actually find you if they want to. And we're, I'm sure that they're going to. So um, tell them how they can get a hold of you. Do you have a website? Do you have an email address that you want to share? That kind of thing. Yes, I have a website. Uh, it's educatingangels.co, uh, not com.co. And uh, there, are, there is some information there, but if you wanted to uh, contact me directly, it would be anthony.armstrong at wesley.edu. That's my uh, college website, and that would mm-hmm. be uh, the best uh, way to contact me. So could you repeat that one more time? anthony.armstrong mm-hmm. at Wesley. W e s l e y. dot e d u. Okay, perfect. Thank you. Okay, so first of all, one of the, the things that I really want to know is how did you get involved in happiness education? You know that is a uh, a question. I I have to give a, a little bit of, of history here. Okay, that's, is that history is good. Go for it. <laughs> Now, I was in graduate school, and I was um, going to get my Ph.D. in political science, which I call the dark arts. <laughs> and I was uh, actually very much into the scholarship part of it, and I had uh, many theories. The teaching part of it was something I thought I would have to do to make a living. But I had a relevance crisis during that time. I realized that um, I wouldn't actually make too much difference in other people's lives if I was just a scholar. Mm-hmm. Uh, that, that, I, that making a difference in other people's lives, which is actually is my aspiration, um, would have to be what the direct impact I would make, and that would be on students. And that when I realized that, that I became a teacher in avocation, as well as vocation. And uh, so then as I started teaching, uh, I was kind of a young Turk and wanted to uh, do the, the best I could and try to figure out um, how best to teach what I was teaching. But I'm a philosophical type, and I kept asking, well, actually, what is it worthwhile to teach? And slowly but surely, I realized that what I was teaching actually wasn't that important to my students' lives. And it's something that slowly developed over the next uh, couple decades that um, I I did realize that affecting their happiness was the most important thing I could do. Mm -hmm. And the more I thought about that, and um, slowly but surely, um, I ended up becoming very focused on that. And I tried uh, getting different programs and different courses, et et cetera, at Wesley College and actually did get uh, a spearheaded an honors program that I think is uh, rather innovative going in that direction I thought it should go. Uh, But, um, you know, actually, I I, I think there's just an inner impulse that was pushing me. There was different things that happened that just kept, kept pushing me in the direction uh, finally, um, I wanted to put it all together and put it into a book, uh, which I did. Mm-hmm. And um, it, it's Educating Angels, Teaching for the Pursuit of Happiness. I love that, that title. Uh, yeah, it, it came out in uh, 2013. The, um, the reason I chose Educating Angels is because it makes the moral argument that um, the we should really value students, our children, for themselves and not just use them for the good of society. And that becomes the moral argument. Um, the primary pursuit of all human beings 
is the pursuit of happiness and um, actually taking that seriously, uh-huh. trying to empower students' pursuit of happiness. It, it just occurred to me that's a no-brainer. That should be the main focus of education from kindergarten on all the way through college. Okay. Um, and what was the response of your colleagues when you decided this? Um, disinterest, a bit of disbelief. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I thought you were a political scientist. Um, but I'm at a college that's small enough that I, I could do it. I didn't really feel uh, too much uh, pressure to do anything else. Uh-huh. Uh, I did um, push some of the the, the ideas, and I, I actually did achieve getting an honors program that was going in the direction that I should, it should go. Uh-huh. And um, the honors program, I take the big questions. We have four seminars and the big questions of life where we can actually get very philosophical and I think lead students to important realizations of the exam at life. Four seminars. The first one is uh, the nature of reality, second, the nature of knowledge, the third, the good life, you know, which is, I thought that's a great course to teach, although I never got to teach it. And then fourth, the uh, social good. And um, so I was building up to that when I finally started saying, telling my colleagues and the and the uh, others at the college administration that, you know, we really are really what they believe in. I, I, um, last Friday, I got to interview, or I guess it was Saturday. No, I don't know when it was. The time has been flying all over the place because it's been kind of crazy. But anyway, last week sometime, before Thanksgiving, so it wasn't last Saturday, um, I got to interview, um, his name is Jeffrey Golitz, and he's one of the top educated, educators in the heartmathinstitute.org. Oh, yeah, I've heard of that. They are phenomenal, and it's a global organization, and um, and they're doing things with kids that you wouldn't believe. I mean, all over the world, they really are, including that he was telling me that when you, when they sit down with a group of kids, um, and some of them are as young as five and six years old, and he'll say, they'll ask him, well, if you could, if you, what's your big dream? What could you do? If you wanted to do something big, what would it be? And he, and he said, you know, in the beginning, they didn't really have any expectations of what these kids, and they, it wasn't a judgment call. They didn't care. You know, it was they just wanted to know what their dreams were. And he said, these little kids were coming up with, we want world peace. We want global warming to go away. We want to fix the oceans so that the water is clean for the fish and the dolphins and the whales. We, we want people to be nice to each other. We want our teachers to be happy. I mean, it was it was wonderful. And, and they have some really interesting programs that um, I've been looking into that that you can become a mentor or a coach or a trainer for them. And it's all an online program. And you can um, sign up either just to take the course or you can sign up and then um, go out and, and teach it, you know, with a license from them. And it's it's really interesting. So it you're the kind of person they probably would love, so you should look into it. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. I actually I have uh, when I was uh, researching the book. Um, one thing I did find is that actually there are a lot of different initiatives that go in, go into this. I mean, that is uh, actually quite a few that teach mindfulness, for example, in right. schools. Right. And, right. Right. Uh, there are um, Goldie Hawn and others have, have started programs and. Um, um, Social and emotional learning, mm-hmm. number of of things that uh, really taken off. So uh, there's definitely an interest in um, affective value uh-huh. theory, but it's simply this: is that the value, the personal value of any experience in the moment you experience it, is what you feel about it. Uh-huh. No feeling, no value. Uh-huh. That feeling is fundamentally important to the value of of life's experiences. That they are at the core of it. You know, if you were uh, had absolutely no emotions, uh, but could still, you know, get the data through your senses and and uh, make sense of it, um, but didn't care, 
but didn't care. It would actually, you wouldn't care about what was happening. You wouldn't care about the data. You wouldn't care about uh, what you were thinking or what you were doing. Caring is feeling. Right. So at the very heart of what are the value of experiences to us is a feeling. So feelings are fundamentally important. That's something that I, I realized. And of course, it took me a while, you know, uh, being an intellectual, uh, <laughs> you, we, you know, put a great deal of value on the mind. But it is something that I realized that the heart is the master, the mind is the servant. Right. And we, get, we turn that around in education, mm -hmm. that we teach to the mind rather than the heart. But right. it is fundamentally important. Do you think you, that it was always that way? Actually, education, um, see, in the, the earlier times, there was sometimes wisdom taught to the most fortunate. Right. Uh, most, uh, mostly it was things that were practical. I mean, you can go back to, you know, Plato and Aristotle, you know, talking to small groups of, of, of people um, about philosophical questions. Uh, I don't think most of it was like that. Uh, over time... Of course, a lot of the education would have been um, what you need to, for aristocrats, you know, what they need, languages, philosophy, etc., so that they uh, could um, sound better than the peasants. Uh, and then uh, education in the modern era is basically based on industrial needs. You know, it, uh, public education grew with the growth of industry mm -hmm. and uh, they needed workers who had uh, the basic thinking skills, you know, for that. And I, that's still basically the model of education that we have. It's, it is um, focused on the needs of the economy, um, on, for jobs, etc. And that's one of the arguments I made that actually that is betraying our, our kids. Um, right. Because I do believe teachers really care. Oh, yes. I think, mo mo I think they care deeply, actually. And making a difference in the lives of, of children, I know that many of them want to do that. And um, many times, of course, we're disappointed uh, that we're trying to make that impact and it doesn't seem to be working. So maybe we're kidding ourselves, but I, I like to uh, well, always you know what, planting a seed at but, least. Right, for the, well, you know, uh, what's, I have to say, you know, what's interesting to me, because I taught high school kids um, and I still live in the area where I was teaching. Um, I tend to see them, you know, wandering around Boulder somewhere or whatever, or on Facebook, you know, and, they'll, and it really, it pleases me and surprises me. But the things that I didn't think they were even listening to, they will like feed back to me verbatim years later. I said, you know, when you said da, 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 and I sort of barely remember and going, uh-huh. Well, that really, that changed my life right there. You know, it made me decide that it was time for me to figure out another way of doing things. So I think, well, you know, it's, I don't know. I don't even know if you've had a chance to go on the website, but one of my very favorite quotes um, is on the website, and, and it's, um, well, there's two of them. One of them is from Ralph Waldo Emerson about um, the acorn. You know, and the, mm -hmm. yes, and the, I was on the website. Okay, and then the other one was by Jack Canfield, uh, because you know he was a teacher long before he became Jack Canfield, the author of Chicken Soup of the Soul and all that. Um, and he he talks about that that, and I can't give it verbatim, but basically it's about it's who you are. It isn't the, the it's not about you as a practitioner in terms of as a teacher, it's you, the person, that's what they get, that's what they need, and that's what what they really find so helpful, um, you know, because if you walk in the door and you care about those kids, that, that's what they get, and, and it helps them more than you'll ever, ever know, years later. Actually, yeah, that's exactly been my experience, is that... Uh, caring for the students and for when they experience that, that has been um, what I can use 
best for motivation and, and um, it really does create that type of relationship that's more effective. Mm-hmm. It does. But, um, so it, I was going to ask you because I, I'm, I don't want to get too far off track and as you can tell I can just you know meander on all over the place. Um, I really am interested in your TED Talk. Could you tell us a little bit about your TED Talk and how that came about? Well, yeah, it is a synopsis of the argument that I I made in the book. And I am also trying to put into uh, focus that actually happiness education is something that can be done, can be highly effective, and have an impact way beyond uh, what what you might be able to imagine, and I also make the case that it's not an either or. It isn't, you know, learning how, to, how whether you're going to learn how to read and learn history, or uh, you know, learn math, and, or learn happiness. Right, actually, you can learn happiness while you're learning math. Well, actually, um, there's been a lot of studies on the the impact of these this type of teaching in schools, and what they found is is that students perform better in all academic I'm sure. endeavors. And it, I mean, they're, even on the accountability test, their grades go up, uh, behavior improves. Right. Uh, there's been some, been some news uh, out of Baltimore. I don't know if you've, you've heard that, but uh, uh, teaching um, meditation in inner city schools, which with a lot of problems, et cetera, and that it has had an amazing impact on young students. I mean, behavioral problems, other things have gone way down. Mm-hmm. That this is actually what I'm I'm talking about. That um, I one of the other of, of the three I mentioned too. You know that that happiness is important. That happiness is a feeling. A feelings are important, but also the insight that feelings are not responses to the world outside is not responses to the circumstances or the events. It is, they are responses to your interpretations, to your thoughts, right. to your judgments. Right. You, everything that you get, you give it meaning and the meaning that you give things is what causes your feelings. Mm-hmm. So this then becomes the core idea of what, we can actually do to empower students' pursuit of happiness is to show them, first of all, that thoughts and judgments do affect how they feel. Oh, yeah. And in order to do that, you have to teach them awareness, inner awareness. And you can talk about mindfulness, but mindfulness could be of, of various things, but especially inner awareness. They have to learn how to be aware of what they're feeling. This this becomes then the basis of choosing what they would prefer to feel. And it also becomes the basis for learning how to manage feelings because they would also be taught the connection between what they're thinking, what their judgments are, and what they're feeling, which is the beginning of learning how to manage how they feel. And what I... When I speak about happiness, I'm that um, of course I have my own ideas of what it is, but I believe li- liberal education is empowering students to pursue uh, happiness as they see it, mm-hmm. and that comes down to what you mentioned: uh, giving perspectives rather than than saying this is this is the way. Right. Is the, here's here's a, the different perspectives. It gives them choice, but you know choices are, are fundamental to freedom. Mm-hmm. You know, have you know what the choices are, um, and then also teaching them discernment in the choices, and then finally uh, teaching them the skills to achieve what they choose, which is the heart of liberal education, I believe. Right. But with with happiness, though, it comes down to teaching them how to feel better than they otherwise would from moment to moment and in the long term. So I simplify it in that, those terms. If we could give them the skills that at any moment of, of whatever they're feeling, that they can actually choose to feel better, know how to do that, that that is not actually a small thing. 
that that no. in some ways is is changing the very quality of their lives, the experiential quality of their lives. And it leads to many other uh, very um, beneficial types of things that I, I would get into. Mm-hmm. So what I'm what I'm trying to to um, show though is that this is doable. We can right. do this in our schools, right. and it's it will actually enhance all, all the other goals that we have. But if we made this our primary purpose, and we can do it, it has been done. Um, you were talking about many of the different programs right. that are already out there. I mean, uh, from from mindfulness to well, uh, there never can be too many, as far as I'm concerned. But it, it was very encouraging to see how many people are really on the same wavelength. I mean, much more than you think. It's kind of sometimes when teachers are out there in the trenches, they don't realize how many people really do completely honor the work that they do and really are very glad that there are good teachers in the world. And, you know, you never hear that anymore at all. So I have a question. Do you Does your university have um, a teacher program, teacher training program? Yes, yes, it does. As an education department, have you talked to anybody in that department to see if you could set up a happiness class for them? <laughs> Actually, uh, I have I talked to them, and they they do have uh, some of an interest. What um, we changed our core curriculum, and uh, we changed it. So, so that we can teach things that we're very interested in. So I actually have a happiness course, and actually I find a lot of the um, uh, students in ed- in education uh, take that class when they get in. It, it's um, I'm probably going to have to add sections because there's it's Good. always <laughs> it's always full. But um, yeah, I mean, if there I am giving them the basics, everything, the philosophy, the science, and finally get into the uh, education part of it and the latter part of it because it is a, a course on happiness, mm-hmm. right? But um, yeah, it, it's where I I think probably differ from, from others. And as I said, there are movements. In fact, it was something that started uh, to really catch on in uh, Britain and Australia and uh, very consciously moving towards happiness education, but it was always kind of on the periphery over there. What I am saying that empowering the pursuit of happiness should be the primary purpose of education, Mm -hmm. that it should be the hub around which everything else that is taught is the wheel. And I believe that is quite doable. And I, I'm talking about uh, some aspect of of the program of teaching or empowering the pursuit of happiness as being um, taught every day in school for at least an hour. And it would uh, prog- it would move, you know, from kindergarten. It should start in kindergarten all the way, and it would change over time with progression become have ever more academic components. But at the very foundation, um, students, young children, should be taught about mindfulness, about being aware of their feelings. They should hear other kids talk about their feelings. They should be get the vocabulary to talk about feelings, uh, to actually share in those type of things make them far more aware of their own feelings and it makes them much more aware of how other kids are feeling and it actually really helps relationships is when you understand how other people are really feeling you're not as afraid of them well communication um do you um do you have any stories for us around students or kids and happiness well um yeah, I actually have I've been accumulating them at, at teaching the happiness course, which I've been doing for a couple of years. But um, I think a student that I definitely had made an impact on was um, he was um, a young man and he had been in both Iraq and Afghanistan. And uh, he had PTSD, had gone through some very terrible types of experiences and he was having a lot of problems. And in taking my course, I think I lit a light 
in his mind. I mean, he he uh, uh, could see that I, you know, I, I really cared, and uh, he he would come come uh, talk to me, and and uh, basically he was telling me that I was um, having a much more better impact on his problems than his therapist had, <laughs> and. Um, well, I think learning that happiness comes from within is such yes. a really important part of any learning process. You know, it, when you, you, um, I, I have three grandchildren and, and I just adore them. They're, they're so much fun. Um, but they're so funny because they come up with some really interesting questions, like out of the blue kind of things. And and I'll say something about well, it's just important to be happy. And as, especially um, one of my grandchildren, um, the youngest, he'll say, "Well, how can you be happy if if you know everybody is sad?" And I said, "Well, you can surround them. Uh, we talk about bubbles surrounding people with pink light mm-hmm. and white light and all of that. But then ultimately, you have to remember that they don't want you to be sad because they're sad." You know, they, you, you have to be who you are. And I know that basically you're a very happy kid because I've watched you play and dance and do all kinds of things all by yourself. Even you don't even have to have other people to play with. And you are basically very happy. And that doesn't come from outside of you. That comes from inside of you. And, and I realized that I think people have forgotten that. You know, I think they don't they don't know that happiness comes from within. They think it comes from having a lot of toys or having a lot of cars or having a lot of money or having the perfect relationship or having the biggest house. And then when they get all of those things and they're still miserable, then we see what happens to them, you know. And it um I so I think it's really important because the one place that they would get a solid foundation in wisdom, because I think that's what being happy within yourself is, is tuning into your own wisdom. And mm-hmm. I think that that's really an important part of not just children's education, but the people on our planet's education. Well, is, wisdom is living according to what you really want and you were you know speaking about others feeling uh, unhappy and what you can do about that um what you said is that happiness comes from within is a very important message and actually many people will say that or have heard that it's just that they don't live their lives like that right that that we do have a society that teaches them that happiness does come from without because if you're finding it within, you wouldn't be buying their products. <laughs> which well, you, you might buy their company. products, but you're not, <laughs> not under the delusion that it's going to make you any happier. That's, I mean, well, I think that's, right. that's the key is, you know, to actually realize that, I mean, you, things aren't what makes people happy. You know? Yeah, and the science of happiness, which is you know really taken off, it, it, and that's what it shows right. is that uh, the external type of things. There are certain ways that you can engage with with the world and and with others. Uh, for example, uh, when you're actually helping other people, it makes you feel good. I mean, it it feels good to do good, right. and that is kind of a fundamental thing. But it also feels good to think well of others. Mm-hmm. Because it it isn't when you're doing well, it's it's also kind of the thoughts that you have. Creative engagement actually is also something that is is important. I mean, finding being able to find your passion and what what you're doing. I think a lot of with creativity, it is is that you become so engaged that you get into flow. Is that right, something exactly. concept? Yeah, yes. and you lose your sense of self and and time, and you're not worrying. Um, about the future, gnawing bones about the past, and which is uh, one of the best feelings that people find is when they can kind of lose themselves in something like that. And creativity can do that. 
Right. You know, that's when you're really engaged in those things. And I, and I really do believe that uh, giving more opportunity for students to discover their passion by having many more types of things that they can try out in school would be part of that. Mm -hmm. But fundamentally, though, it is the inner awareness that is the foundation that would lead on. That it was yeah, That would be the foundation of what you can build on so that they can learn the skills. For example, what can you do and when you're feeling something that you don't want to feel? If right. you're feeling fear or anger, if you're li living in uh, chaotic circumstances, where can you find uh, a little emotional haven for a little while right. to escape from that, which a lot of kids need. Also, uh, I think a lot of kids uh, have to discover what um, I think all human beings uh, have, have done down through time, and that is uh, what nature can do for them. Oh, absolutely. Yeah, that, that, Even that, when it's cold. <laughs> Oh, yeah. I mean, at, at, if you're sitting there warm or looking out the window, I mean, you could still enjoy nature. Right, right. But, but um, I think all of these things, though, they all come down to what we would do to allow them to, first of all, know what they really want to feel and then learn how to do that. And they would... In doing this, they would have the intrinsic rewards of feeling better. They wouldn't need grades, the extrinsic rewards that, that we use. That uh, From the research into this, that actually uh, kids really respond to it, you know, starting in, in kindergarten, that they really like these things. They like the, to know that they have the power to change how they feel. Mm -hmm. That they also learn more and more uh, about the rewards of relationships as i said because a lot of this is understanding your feelings and hearing other kids talk about it. it's a lot more of sharing of what's going on inside you right but also to know that in any situation that uh the power to change what you're feeling is something you do within right. it isn't some, you don't have to change the world but I wouldn't want to be pedantic uh, about it, as I said, that I believe liberal education is to show them what the choices are, give them the different perspectives, uh, show them so they have some discernment, you know, the consequences of choices, mm -hmm. teach them the basic skills that they would need uh, no matter what choice they made. Right. And that. Uh, and therefore, it would be um, a liberal education. It wouldn't tell them this is what happiness is and, and this right. is how you get it. <laughs> it. It would say these are the choices you have. And I think we'd also have to tell them, well, one of the things that you're being taught is is that making a lot of money is going to make you happy. Well, you know, here's the, the evidence <laughs> on that. But that is what a lot of people believe. Well, we've run out of time, and we've had such an amazing conversation with Dr. Anthony Armstrong, and we're starting our year off, 2017, with his great words of wisdom. So I do hope that you enjoyed this podcast, and you can listen to it as many times as you want or download it all for free. Thank you for joining me here at the Creativity, Thinking, and Education podcast. Please visit us at happyteachershappystudents.com. And if you find value in this podcast and the message that we are trying to spread, then click the subscribe button and give my show a review, hopefully a good one. I am so excited to be able to share the timeless awareness of our guests. There are they're varied and they're fascinating and they're absolutely wonderful. Thank you and have a wonderful year.
Thank you for joining me here at the Creativity Thinking and Education Podcast. Please visit us at happyteachershappystudents.com. And if you find value in this podcast and the message we are trying to spread, then click the subscribe button and give my show a review, hopefully a good one. I am so excited to be able to share the timeless awareness of all of our guests. Talk to you next Tuesday.